I've spoken about degeneracy pressure before. I've mentioned it here and there when talking about metallic hydrogen or white dwarfs, and I feel like I haven't given it the serious discussion that it really deserves to so really dig down and get our fingernails dirty and explore where this phenomenon, this, this purely quantum mechanical effect in our universe, where it really comes from and, and what the origin is. Uh, but I have to be a little bit careful because going too far down the road of explaining degeneracy pressure gets into a huge viper pit of quantum mechanics and eventually I'll get there but I don't want to spend like an entire episode or series of a dozen episodes getting into the quantum mechanics of it because there's so much other cool stuff to explore so I'm going to do my best where I'm going to talk about degeneracy pressure and I'll say where where it gets a little bit deeper where it gets a little bit weird and leave it at that and to explain degeneracy pressure, to really go back, to, to peel back the layers to see where this is coming from, we have to pretend we're dealing with, say, just say we have two particles. Two particles that are completely 100% identical. They're twins, like you, you really can't tell them apart. So they can be like this, and they can be like this, and you don't even know the difference. But for convenience sake, let's for, say for convenience, you want to keep track of these two particles, so you give them names. You call one, say, Adrian, and you call the other one Enrico. So you have Adrian and Enrico, and they're, since they're twins, since they're identical, they could be a little bit mischievous. Sometimes they like to swap labels, like you attach your little Adrian name tag on one and the little uh, Enrico name tag on the other, but if they swap them, you wouldn't know the difference. As long as Adrian and Enrico are far apart, you can't, you, you can keep track of them. You can totally keep track of them because you're watching them. You've got your eye on both. Okay, the, Enrico's over here and Adrian's over here and maybe they start moving around, but you're gonna keep track of that. And as long as you can keep track of their positions, you're good. You're good. Even though they're totally indistinguishable, you can use their current position and their past trajectories to keep them separate, or to keep them separated in your brain, to so make sure the labels are straight. Okay, it, but what happens if you bring them closer? What happens if you bring them really close together? Well, in this situation, quantum mechanically, they kind of overlap. Remember, particles aren't just particles in quantum mechanics. There's a certain, let's call it fuzziness, associated with each particle, where you're not exactly sure where a particle is. There's a little cloud of probability surrounding every particle, where the next time you measure, you're gonna spot it somewhere within that cloud. Again, if they're far apart, this is totally cool. Adrian is over here, or was it Enrico? I think it was Adrian was over here and Enrico's over here. But you bring them together where their fuzziness overlaps. Then when you close the door and you don't look or you, you put them in a box and you don't look and then you open up the box and make a new measurement. Well, which is it? Is it Adrian and, Mar and Enrico or is it Enrico and Adrian? Well, We've got a little problem, don't we? Not only are these particles identical, they have, they have the exact same charge and spin and mass, everything, but they're also indistinguishable. I can't tell them apart when I open the box, when they're nice and close together. Okay, now in quantum mechanics, in quantum mechanics, we need to describe the situation. We need to write down some mathematical formulas that describe this overlap between our two indistinguishable, part indistinguishable particles. Now, it turns out that in the mathematical description of these two particles, of Adrian and Enrico, there are only two allowed possibilities. In the, in the whole realm of mathematical descriptions that you could use to, to label these two indistinguishable particles, one of these days I'm gonna be able to say that word correctly, there are only two allowed forms of the equations. One form of the equations, you can swap their places and nothing changes. 
In other words, when we swap the particles, they are completely symmetric. They are symmetric here. Nothing changes, nothing changes, nothing changes, nothing changes. In the other allowable configuration, when you swap the particles, a little minus sign pops out in the math. Just whoop, you swap their positions and a little negative sign pops out. Now that negative sign doesn't really affect anything observationally. You still have two particles. It's not like you measure a negative particle. It's something that pops up in the mathematics. This is called anti-symmetric. So symmetric is when you swap positions and everything's the same. Anti-symmetric is when you swap positions and a little minus sign pops up. Okay, now it also turns out that there's two kinds of particles in the world. There's what we call fermions and there's what we call bosons. You remember quantum spin, this fundamental property that all particles have, just like mass and charge, they have this quantity called spin. And different kinds of particles, different species of, of particles have different values of spin. Some of them might be spin zero, some might be spin a half, spin one, spin three halves, spin two, etc., etc. It turns out that the spin half particles, if you have a spin half, three halves, five halves, something like that, you are called a fermion. And if your spin, a whole integer spin, like spin zero, spin one, spin two, spin etc., etc., you're called a boson. Now it turns out that the bosons, if you have whole spin, then when you're in this indistinguishable situation, let's say Adrian and Enrico are completely indistinguishable and they're bosons, they could swap places, they could swap places and nothing would change. They are completely symmetric. The bosons choose, for lack of a better word, the symmetric solution. But if the two particles are fermions, if they're fermions, if they have half integer spin, like mm, an electron, a proton, a quark, most of the particles you're familiar with that are the building blocks of matter, they always choose the anti-symmetric case. And this is where we run into trouble. Let's say, let's say Adrian and Enrico are fermions. They're spin half, say they're electrons, say they're just electrons. And they are completely 100% identical. Same mass, same charge, same, same spin, same energy level, same everything. And they're in this indistinguishable scenario and they swap places. Well, if they were 100% identical, where they had, they had the exact same state, where they had the exact same mass, charge, energy level, spin position, everything, then swapping them shouldn't make a difference, right? They should look Exactly the same. Like you can't tell if they really are indistinguishable and identical, 100% identical, then you do this and it's no different. But the mathematics says a min minus sign pops out for this anti-symmetric case. But how can we have something where in one view it swaps positions and nothing changes, but in the mathematical description swaps places and a minus sign pops out? The only number that is a negative of itself is zero, which means there is no solution, there is no description. So we arrive at the conclusion that if Adrian and Enrico really are fermions, they cannot have the exact same state. They must, they must have different states because they can't swap positions and leave this minus sign dangling. They have to be different. If they're different, then this with Adrian on one side and Enrico on the other is different than Enrico and Adrian. They have to have different quantum states. No two fermions can occupy the exact same quantum state. This is the Pauli exclusion principle at work. And this is the source. This is the ultimate source of degeneracy pressure. It comes from this statement that no two fermions can occupy the exact same quantum state. The quantum state describes everything about the particle, mass, charge, 
spin direction, and most crucially for degeneracy pressure, for energy level. Not all electrons, not all fermions can occupy the lowest energy level. They're always gonna be populated to higher energy levels because they can't cram down any further. This ultimately sources degeneracy pressure. And it comes from this fundamental construct that fermions, when they're in this situation, when they're in this indistinguishable situation, they always choose the anti-symmetric solution. Now, I, through a lot of this video, I said it turns out like it just so happens. And in pure quantum mechanics, and in good old fashioned quantum mechanics, you just have to add those statements in as like postulates, as like raw statements of nature, as like this is the way nature works and we can tell from experiment and so that's the way it is. If you combine quantum mechanics with special relativity, you can actually derive this, something called the spin statistics theorem. That's not theory, that's theorem, this is a mathematical proof from the marriage of special relativity with quantum mechanics, you can actually prove that if you have a half integer spin, like one half or three halves or five halves, then you must be anti-symmetric. And if you have a whole integer spin, like zero, one, or two, then you must be symmetric under this interchange of positions. And that is like way too much to go into today. I. If you want, I can dig into the mathematics for you and we can talk about it in another episode, but definitely not today. I think this is far enough that degeneracy pressure, this concept, comes from a very, very basic core facet of our universe. And it's purely quantum mechanical, which is super awesome. Thank you so much for watching. If you like the video, please click the like button and subscribe and make sure you are alerted to notifications and uh, go to patreon.com slash so I can keep making these videos because who doesn't want to keep talking about the fundamental processes that govern our universe? Nobody. That is the answer. Nobody doesn't want to stop. Wait, how many negatives did I do?